Welcome to the Level Up Artist Podcast. We are your hosts, Adriana Ame and Jackie Sanders. We are two art professionals sharing for the advice and business lessons we have learned along our creative journeys. We talk to artists, leaders, and art professionals to demystify the creative process and discover new ways to succeed as a career-minded artist. If you find value in these conversations, please go ahead and subscribe. This will help other creatives like you find our podcast and you'll be notified when we drop a new episode every Tuesday. So on today's podcast episode, we're really excited. We have a guest artist, Chieko Murasugi. Uh, Chieko was born in Tokyo, raised in Toronto, and based in San Francisco for 20 years before moving to North Carolina in 2012. She has degrees in experimental psychology and studio art. She has exhibited her work nationally in galleries and museums, and her paintings reside in the public collections of the city of Raleigh and Duke University. Recently, she was awarded the Hambage Center Residency and a North Carolina Arts Council Art Support Grant. She is co-founder and co-curator of Basement, a provisional artist-run project space in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. She and her neuroscientist husband are the parents of two adult children. Welcome to the podcast, Chieko. You have a very interesting background. This is not the went to art school first kind of background. This is, you went science first. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on this podcast. I'm super excited. And um, I guess I will have to share about my roundabout history. (laughs) Um. (laughs) Yeah, we're so excited to have you hear a little bit more about your creative journey. All right, Chico. So you've lived in and been exposed to various cultures from Japan to Canada, California to North Carolina. How do they influence your art? How do they show up? You know, what what do you feel like, you know, how are they represented in your art? Uh, Well, uh, you know, when I was living in each of those places, I I never thought about, you know, this is how this place is affecting my painting. But I like to think about it in hindsight, you know, what, what, I, what I've learned from each of the places I've lived. Now, the Japan, I was only there for three and a half years. And so what I, all the japanese things that show up in my art, people seem to see them all the time, you know, and probably projecting, seeing me. But um, that I learned from sort of indirectly from my, my parents. My parents were born and bred in Japan and we spoke Japanese at home and, you know, they were culturally very Japanese. So... Um, I picked up, um, you know, my mother's aesthetic, um, you know, the the cultural, um, um, uh, you know, the various cultural artifacts we had in the house. So anyhow, the Japanese came from them. And in Canada, that's interesting because when I was growing up in Canada, I'd say the 70s and 80s, I mean, that's where I spent, say, the first 32 years old except for Japan, the first 30 years of my life. And that's where I was educated from, you know, all the way to graduate school. Um, but in terms of my art education, there are two influences that I'd say are very strong. And during the 70s and 80s, Inuit art, especially from Cape Dorset, was very, very popular. And so was the um, so were the paintings of the group of seven. So Inuit art is, you know, at that time was... Consider it was outsider art. It had a you know childlike feel. Um, it was it was flat, colorful, um, incredibly um, moving, um, um, fun uh, depictions of you know the day to day life of the Inuit people. And then the uh, the group of seven. So they were a group of um, landscape painters who prided themselves on painting the Canadian landscape, but they were highly influenced by the Europeans. So the post-impressionists and some of the Scandinavian painters and Art Nouveau and the art of the Inuits and the group of seven was ubiquitous. They were on every calendar in every stationery store. And we th- thought about Canadian art, it was those, those two <laughs> influences. <laughs> and, and thinking about the similarity between the Inuit and the Group of Seven art, I mean, they were both, I would say, uh, colorful and the, the space was quite flattened and there was a lot of patterning. And 
So thinking about it now, you know, those that describes my work too. I have a shallow space, which is uh, characterized their work, and there is patterning, and there's this love of color, you know. Um, so those are major artistic influences. I mean, when I went to to um, when I did my BFA at, uh, at York University in Toronto, of course, I took art history and I learned about Canadian art history and, and so on. Um, so there was that. I mean, I could go into that, but that's, that's... <laughs> and the other thing about Canada is the um, is the light. You know, my paintings on the on overall have. I use a coolish palette. Even when I use warm colors, there's sort of a cool sense to them. And I think that comes from the Canadian light. You know, it's winter half the year, even the summers are short and the, the light is very different from, you know, like tropical light, say. Okay, so that's the, those are the three influences <laughs> from Canada. And then in San Francisco, Oh, wow. So that was where I sort of became, my eyes were open to the art world. Okay, so in terms of my own development, I it was a, a very exploratory phase. I think I alluded to the fact that I was, you know, I tried illustration, I was, you know, painted from the figure for many years. Um, I, you know, played with different media, watercolor, whatever, um, acrylic. And also, while I was there, the De Young Museum and the new SF MoMA opened up. And oh my gosh, you know, the work that I saw there, I mean, I still just, oh, you know, it just makes me kind of in awe of the, the, of the artists that I discovered there, you know, like Eva Hess or Kiki Smith or Richard Diebenkorn or Richard Tuttle. Um, you know, contemporary masters I had huge shows there. And I just am in such gratitude of the wonderful shows I saw there. And I would also go downtown to the, um, I think it was first Thursday of every month. And I'd go down with a, it's like our, our art walks, but it was down the downtown gallery. So I saw what the contemporary artists were showing. So, you know, and I also attended art schools there, the Art Institute, the Academy of Art College. So it was it was a huge, like a broadening of my experience. And, you know, it, well, I ended up in San Francisco because I, for science, you know, I went to Stanford to do a postdoctoral fellowship in neurobiology. So that's what got me there in the first place. But after two years, I left that field and um, Sort of went into art so that's san francisco and then i come to north carolina and this is where i become quote a professional artist you know i've found studios outside my house you know first it was the golden belt studios and now i have this one in um outside of chapel hill you know i've become part of the art community i did my mfa at unc chapel hill and you know, I've I've shown in the area, and this is where I feel like, okay, now my career is artist, and yeah. um, you know, that's been wonderful. So, so up until this point, um, was art just a side thing, like a just a hobby, or were you still showing, exhibiting, and things like that? Just not, just more on a like, were you a part time artist up until this point? Let's kind of up until you moved to North Carolina, were you more doing it part time? Well, I mean, I always had a, um, so I was in San Francisco for 20 years and I wasn't really a hobbyist, but I also, it was part-time in the sense that I had two children, you know, San Francisco is where I raised my children. So they were born there. And um, when I moved to San Francisco, I had two children. And when I, when I moved to North Carolina, my oldest, uh, my daughter was going off to college. So she was out of the house and my son was starting high school. So, you know, he was pretty much pretty independent by that point. But in San Francisco, you know, I was the mom. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I painted while they were in school. I had a studio in the house. I showed what I could. Um, but, you know, the mothering came first. So when I wasn't being a mother, um, I was, I was working. So I, I guess in terms of by necessity, I was not a full-time artist, but it was always extremely important to me. And I was always painting and I was showing, you know, as much as I could. 
I love that. It's like, and everybody, you know, sometimes I know folks get a little impatient and they're like, but I want to do all the things now. And it's like, well, we all go through different seasons of life and depending what else you're going on. But I love that even then you were going to museums and exhibitions and things like that. So it's almost like it was building up this mountain of like ideas and influences and like styles, like, you know, this is a lifetime worth of, you know, artistic inspiration oh, yeah. accumulating so that, yeah. you know, now you can just go full force. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. But I do have to ask you, you know, since you did end up pursuing an MFA in art, right. Um, which I think that's, you know, super interesting, of course, and, you know, amazing. And you did kind of cover earlier how like that helped you with the way that your work is expressed now. But I have to ask, however, you also have a PhD in experimental psychology, which is like, wait, art and psychology? How does, does that show up in your art too? Or how does it fit in the picture? I'm totally intrigued. <laughs> I mean, as you can imagine, I get asked that a lot. And then it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, because it's just so, you know, I spent maybe 10 years as a scientist and it's just so much part of me that I don't really think now I'm being a scientist, now I'm not. But, you know, it's always there. And I think that um, I often think, what if, and I think that's the scientist in me, what if I did this, what would happen? You know, and apparently um, Joseph Albers was like that too. I mean, he was an artist, but he, he worked very much in a scientific way in that he took, you know, one problem and kind of pursued it, you know, investigated that in, in, in a very systematic, meticulous way. Um, I would say that in my case, sometimes the science, scientist in me is fairly latent and I tried to, and I paint in a, a very intuitive process related way without really planning it out. And then it ended up, inevitably happens that and then at some point the scientist in me kind of comes forward and it's happened actually in the last couple of months my work has changed I've started exploring something in a very quote scientific way um, so instead of working in this intuitive process related fashion but also with a lot of sketching in between like the work that I described to you I mean you know, they're developed through hundreds of sketches. So it's not as if they are kind of slapdash, I guess. But the work I've started now, in fact, there's some in the back that I didn't really want to go into too much. But, um, I had described how everything, like I tried to put all the different components of our identities or our lives into a painting, you know. But one thing, that I find lacking was this element of chance or the idea of randomness, because so much of our lives are changed, altered, you know, affected by what seems like chance-like encounters, you know. And and I really wanted to get that sense of randomness in my work. And, and so I have started exploring the idea of random. So I'm making these pattern, fairly patterned pieces where some of it is a pattern, and then I put in kind of random components using a random.org, which is a computer um, program that, that generates for you, gives you random sequences of numbers. So in that, I'd say I'm working through as a scientist, you know, I'm trying this, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do this? You know, and they're like little experiments. So that's, you know, so, so that's, uh, you know, the scientists coming out in the fore. But I think it's probably all in there, but sometimes I notice it more than other times. Yeah, some of those are very, like, literal applications of the scientific process. And right. as we've discussed, I feel like when it boils down to it, a lot of the creative process as artists and how we perceive the world and experience the world can be very similar to the scientific process. We're basically just asking questions and creating problems that we then want to solve. Mm -hmm. So putting yes. those metrics into place of, okay, well, these are the variables. You have the principles of design, you have color, you have composition, you have X, Y, Z. 
And then yes. what are all the ways in which I can apply and question and change those to create new end products? Yes. I mean, I think artists are very, you know, very experimental, you know, and they're, um, you know, often looking at the edge of what's known, trying to pursue something that's new. And all of that is, um, that's very similar to what scientists do. But the difference is, is that scientists are trained in the scientific method. You know, we have a very particular kind of, you know, way, method of, of pursuing and acquiring knowledge. And so, for instance, you know, I might, quote, discover something in my random experiments. But if I were a scientist, I'd have to reproduce that discovery under yeah. very controlled conditions, you know, like my discovery you know, might be the result of using these particular colors, but maybe, you know, these results don't generalize to other colors. You know, maybe I see the effect, but maybe you wouldn't, you know. So um, so to really to say I have discovered this, it, there's a high bar to, to <laughs> scientists to sort of prove that that effect it actually exists. Yeah. Um, especially when so it comes I, to recreating gestural marks, I'm sure. I know a lot of your work is very like clean, sharp edges, use of color, but of course, then think about other art forms, thinking of using a palette knife to create a stroke, trying to replicate that. Even if you control every variable you think, that's sometimes the beauty of the work, or even one is slightly more glossy than another form. That you really can't replicate even when you try, which can be quite a frustrating process as an artist, but that's also the beauty of some of the work that we make too. Yeah. And, yeah. I like and that's, that's what I like about art actually, is that I can explore things and do quote research or whatever, but I don't have to be so formally rigorous about it, you know, in the sense that, that a scientist has to be. Um, so I can have the fun without the, <laughs> without the, the, you know, the very um, elaborate process that, that uh, the scientists have. Yeah, um, it's definitely a dance between the intuitive and the practice that you've already done it because it's like it's already in you. You've been doing certain things over and over and proving yourself, asking those questions, then making a theory, then <laughs> then testing it out and then seeing the result. And then it just yeah. it's all data in a way, it inputs itself. But also it's that dance between, you know, is it, per is it on purpose? Is it serendipity? Like, or is it actually just a combination of inputs in your brain that, that just come out? Like I love talking to folks that, you know, being that we are in a public facing studio, we'll get questions or, like, I don't understand what the parallel is between, you know, of course, we're saying science and art, and there's many, or they'll say like, uh, computer programming, right, and art, and it's like, oh, there's many parallels, because we are looking at things that don't exist yet. And we have ideas that are still abstract, and then we're going through this process, scientific or not, um, but we have to go through a process that we have to learn, and it's a language all in itself in order to get a visible result at the end. So in talking even with software engineers, I'm like, oh no, there's a lot of what we do that's similar to what you guys do. We are dancing too with left brain, right brain, left brain, left. you know, it's, it's both. The analytical, the intuitive, the analytical, the intuitive, which actually brings me to a question because a lot of times people get stuck in the fun part that you mentioned, the intuitive, that part of the dance, but we do have to put the analytical hat on at some point or another. So from your perspective, how do you figure out when a piece of art is done? Like it's ready, that's it. Paint mm -hmm. brushes down, don't touch it, it's mm -hmm. done. Well, um, these pieces that I'm working on now are different, but to talk about the the work that, um, that I've shown the most, which is, you know, these collage paintings. So what I have discovered is as I'm working on these pieces, I feel like I go through like the history of modernism in my pieces. Like I look at a piece and, you know, part way and I think, oh my gosh, you know, that really reminds me of say Picasso. And it's beautiful. I love Picasso, but I can't, I can't let this go because it's not me. It's still Picasso. And then I go, you know, I paint before and then it's looking like Matisse or it's looking like 
Stephen Cord, you know, or all these artists who had, you know, kind of in my brain, kind of sh show up. And I'm not sure if other people would recognize that, but for me, I see too, let's say I see too much of Picasso, so I have to go ahead. And I just keep going until I can't see those influences anymore. Yep. And that has to work formally, of course, you know, it has to meet certain, you know, my, my certain, um, you know, criteria of a good composition or color or, or whatever. Um, but when I get all those ghosts out of my painting or those spirits or muses or whatever, and, you know, I feel like it's, it's mine and I can consider it done. And, you know, it takes a long time sometimes to get to that point. Yeah, but, I don't remember the name of the artist, but um, there's the saying that basically says, like, your process as a studio and the artist, you walk into the studio and your teachers are with you and your influences and your masters and everything with you. And then yeah. how does it go? It's just like if you're actually in the flow one by one, they walk out and yeah. at the end you walk out. Yes. And that's yeah. that's it. That's that's the art itself that came out in its purest expression. We're just mediums for it. So yes. I, that's oh my gosh! If I if I find the quote, I'll put it in the in the show notes so people can <laughs> read the full blown part of it. But yeah, you just reminded me of that. It's it's so yeah. good. It's like it's good to have influences, but it's also good to know when yeah. to show them the door. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that's. I mean, I I, I you know I, I did my MFA late in life, and so you know my my advisors and my teachers yes definitely their 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 voices are in there and yes and they also have to be filtered out <laughs> and as we talked about earlier also being a consumer of art in your local community whether different places that you've lived where you've traveled but also in your immediate community in addition to being an artist you're also the co-founder and co-curator at Basement. So what does that role entail? And I'm sure being exposed to all of that artwork inevitably will trickle into your work here and there, at least from a creative influence standpoint. Um, well, first of all, I have to say there are five of us and we are, um, you know, we're equal partners and we make all the decisions as a group, you know, this is like democracy in action. It's, it's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Love that. And, you know, it can also be a little bit slow because, you know, everyone's feedback or everyone's, um, you know, their opinions have to figure into the, all the decisions that we make. Um, but as a group, we, we uh, look for artists, um, you know, and we invite artists, we have studio visits with artists and then they plan shows. Um, you know, now we were having a fundraiser um, along with Peel Gallery. Um, we rank right grants together. So it's been a, a really interesting collaborative process because these are um, my, you know, what one what one of the members is um, a, was uh, not was a, um, a professor of, of mine, and the other three are co. Um, they graduated with me in the MFA program. So, um, so they're much younger than I am and there are different stages in their lives. And so for me, that's really exciting because I actually never had that when I was a young artist. You know? um, so it's as if I'm having this, 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 I don't know, this very tight knit art group that you know that that has a vision and we have our space and 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 so we work together closely and so for to me that's really exciting to be part of that um and in terms of the art you know I, i'm kind of i don't know what you call you know i'm an abstract painter whereas these artists are more interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary you know they're uh, maybe more kind of social activist artists you know so so you know, they're they create, we all create very different types of art. And so that's really exciting too. And, and we, we look for artists um, to show who are also very varied, you know, and, um, but, but, um, but experimental. Uh, so I don't know, it, it takes me out of my, my own little niche of painting in my studio and keeps me abreast of what, contemporary artists in this you know in the southeast are doing um so yeah so that's been very fun 
<laughs> yeah, I and feel I, like any role and how you can engage with your community, as we were talking about prior to recording the podcast of you have your role as artist, but also there are so many other ways as an artist, whether you're actively making work presently or not, of how you can be involved with the creative conversation during your community, whether it's volunteering at nonprofits, working at a gallery, or being part of a group like that, um, really connecting with peers around you can be so powerful, um, both from a fulfillment standpoint, but also from your creative voice. It's nice wearing those multiple hats and really staying connected um, to yeah. what's going on around you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely true. I mean, I spend my days, most days of the week, or maybe all days of the week here in my studio, and I'm here all by myself, you know, <laughs> It's a very, and I like it, you know, I like working solo, but it's a very solitary profession to be yeah. a painter or to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And so these bonds that we have with other artists in the community, and especially people who are doing, you know, who are commit, who are doing different kinds of art, it's just, yeah, I think it's, it's a lifesaver, actually. Um, yeah, I think it's yeah. really important. Yeah, we definitely resonate with that. It's like Jackie and I met through an artist group. It was a crit group um, that BAE used to hold. And during the pandemic, it was a lifesaver because we would check in on each other. We were obviously, everybody was isolated. And it was like, okay, what are our goals painting wise this week? What are you working on? You know, kind of like that accountability. And also like, I'm frustrated this is happening. The whole world seems to be shutting down. Like, I don't know. And even out of the pandemic, we are in public facing studios, but the moment you are creating, you are by yourself. So it is nice to be able to walk down the hallway, go to Jackie's studio and be like, hey, yeah. let's go to lunch or something and catch yeah. up or, you know, any of the other artists here. So I absolutely love that. Um, speaking of connections, right, and reaching out, you've exhibited work in museums and galleries nationally. How do you actually connect with you know, the decision makers at these different institutions and pursue these opportunities? You just apply. You know, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. There are no entry to org. <laughs> just, you know, you, you look on, you know, whatever CAA calls or North Carolina, you know, calls and you look at, you know, and you just apply. You know? and get good photos made of your, good images made of your art, and you just, but I do have one um, a bit of advice about the application process. And this is something that um, an artist who was more senior than I um, had told me, and I find it extremely useful. She said, when you're making, when you're applying to these shows and grants and so forth, aim for a 50% acceptance rate. Mm -hmm. She said, if you are getting into like 90% of what you apply for, you are aiming too low. If you're getting only, you know, 10%, then you're aiming too high. If it's 50, you know, you're at the right place. And who knows how accurate that is, but psychologically, that's very, um, I don't know, it's kind of, uh, what's the word, you know, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> it makes you feel better along the process. Yeah, it does. It because does. There's, there's such a range of types of opportunities that you can apply for. It could be a local market just for your town. It could be a right. statewide exhibition. It could be a national exhibition, international. And so there, it is that those variables that you have to think about. Of, of course, yeah. you would love to be able to apply for everything. But sure. no one has that time and a lot of applications also cost money to apply. So you do have to be somewhat selective and making sure that your work fits the work of what you're applying for. Um, yeah. But I love that 50% mark. That's a good gauge. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to shoot too high, but you don't want to shoot too low either. Yeah. yeah. And then this way, you know, if you send out 10 applications and you're rejected to five, it's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. You say, okay, I have to, you know, I selected the right 10, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I heard this from another artist too. He was like, this is a numbers game and this is an artist in Durham. We haven't interviewed him yet, so I won't name drop him. But um, he basically said it is a numbers game. He's like, he he has actually has shows internationally, nationally, has won awards and everything else. And he goes, 
my acceptance rate is 25% because I shoot really high. Even oh, the yes. that I don't think I'm going to get in, he's like, it narrows down to 25. He's like, if you only apply to three things and you get yeah. rejected at two out of three or even all three, it's going to hurt. But he's like, yeah. I apply to like 25 things every month. Yeah. I'm going to get into a lot of them. And then I get a chance to say, no, sorry, I'm booked. <laughs> like, yeah. which feels good too. Or let's check a, a, a further date. But I do yeah. want to ask you, um, and this is something we like to ask all our guests, artists, and our professionals. Um, Chico, how do you define success as an artist? You know, when I first came to the Triangle, um, I didn't mention this, but for five years, I didn't do make art. The last five years I was in San Francisco because I had a creative block, okay? And I did something else. But when I came here, the uh, so in those five years, I was a writer. But when I came here, I didn't feel confident as a writer. So I decided to go back to painting. And But at that time, I said to myself, I want to be respected by other artists in my community. And I think that if I, I would say that was my criterion of success then, and then it still is. And I like it because um, what my community is, there's room for change in what the definition of community is. You know, maybe at one point my community was my fellow artists at Golden Belt Studios, where I had a studio, you know, and then maybe that's expanded to my community is, is now or became, you know, this Chapel Hill artist. And now maybe it's the Triangle artists. So, yes, what however I define my community at that point, I want to be respected by other artists. So I would say that that's my definition of success. I love that. And so, of course, your journey has taken a lot of turns and you've had many different hats that you've worn throughout your creative journey. But what is one piece of advice that you wish you had heard before you got started on your creative journey? Um, I'm assuming that my creative journey didn't start as kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> on this question, but okay. So um, yeah, I think the turning point was after I received my BFA, um, instead of becoming an artist, I went into science. So that's when I went to do my master's and then subsequently my PhD, which was in visual science. So it was visual perception. So it was related to art. And um, at that point, you know, um, you know I, I talked about community and how important that is. And I think that if I had a community like Basement, for instance, you know, a, a core group of artists that I, you know, that work together, I might have become an artist, who knows, but, um, but I didn't. But um, okay, so in terms of advice, I kind of wished at that point that someone had asked, said I could take risks. You know, I'm not a very risk, mm. a person who likes to take risks. And I've probably in retrospect, I've, you know, at that point that when I finished my BFA, it would have been a risk to become an artist. You know, it was a lot easier to go back to school, you know. So in a way, going to do a PhD was the, um, it was a safer option. But anyhow, I would say, you know, when you're young and starting out, um, especially if you're young, that's, that's when, you know, you can afford to take risks, you know. Um, and if I mean, I'm not, not saying you have to be reckless, but you know, really, you know, so that's what I wish someone had said, like, Chieko, you know, maybe try not to take the safe route all the time. You know, maybe you can afford to take a few, few, you know, more risks than you have. So that's, that's what I would say. <laughs> hey, that's, that's okay. Same, same as before seasons in life. And I feel like also our risk tolerance sorry calling on my financial background there for a second a risk tolerance changes over life and depending yes. what our financial situation yes. is and right. our family situation our mental health right. situation like there's so many factors i love hearing that though because there are folks even some of the younger ones that are so conservative like i'll talk to them and they're like yeah i put all my money in the stable value and i'm like why 
you should be in the risky investments. You have all the time in the world to get it back and yeah. like actually gain from that, you know, from those moves. It's literally no, what is it? No risk. What is it? No risk, no gain, essentially. Yeah. Like yeah. it's, this is the time to do it. But regardless of what stage folks are at, I would dare say no matter what age they are, especially if they're getting back into art after a long pause, to me, I'm like, that is when you should take the risk. It's experiment, do whatever you want. Yeah. You're not known for a specific style or aesthetic yet. Mm -hmm. Do whatever. You'll figure it out later on. This is the time to, this is the R&D stage, <laughs> research and development. Yeah. I'm in the middle of that with ceramics. So that's why I'm bringing it up where it's like, I don't know what this is going to look like. Comes out of the kiln. Surprise. You know, it's like, just do whatever. And then you'll figure out the rest down the road. But um, one of the, one of the other questions or one of the last questions we like to ask all our uh, guests on the podcast is if you had a hundred dollars right now, randomly handed to you, um, what would you splurge it on or invest it in? And it has to be something that brings you joy and is related to your art or business? Well, I'm always in need of supplies, right? So I, you know, so I say, okay, you know, my brushes have worn out. I need to get brushes. I need to buy this color paint. But I just think it would be really fun to go to an art store, you know, instead of ordering online, to actually go to an art store and just buy stuff that's, that I don't really need, but might like to have. Yeah. You know, I was thinking maybe a different kind of paint. I mean, I had a friend who used Cassine paint and she said it was milk based. And I thought, well, wow, I mean, that would be kind of fun to try, right? So I think that's what I would do. I would go to an art store and just kind of see what's out there that I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> buy, you know, <laughs> under most circumstances, but Hey, you know, if I could splurge, I think that's what I would do. Just something, buy something interesting and different. <laughs> that's the yeah. perfect answer, I feel like, for your advice as well. Your initial impulse is do the practical, conservative, yeah. expected. And then you're like, you know what? We're going crazy. We're going to buy something different and see what happens. So yeah. I love that you're taking your advice on that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a so, small risk. <laughs> This conversation has been so much fun. Before we let you go with your rest of your studio day, what opportunities do you have coming up that you're looking forward to? And oh. how can our listeners stay in contact with you after this podcast episode? Oh, well, I appreciate that question. Okay, I have two things coming up that I'm really excited about. One is I'm doing a digital residency with the Black Mountain College Museum and Art Center. So it's virtual. So it's it's an Instagram takeover. And that starts on September 29th. I mean, I'm sorry, August 29th to September 1st. Awesome. So for three, four days, I'll be sharing my work and I, I'll be sharing my new work on this, this randomization kind of paradigm and discussing the work and how it relates to the Black Mountain um, College artists and, and their progeny. Um, and then I'll be giving an artist's talk as well about, about my work. So that's super exciting. That's uh, amazing. That's super cool. I've never heard of a virtual residency before, but I see? love that idea. Oh, yeah. We, we actually had them in, um, in basement. We had virtual residencies. We call them digital residencies. And apparently Black Mountain College Museum, so their tag, Instagram tag is at BM Black Mountain C Museum underscore and Art Center. But so anyhow, um, and they've had these before, but I, I think they they stopped for a while and they're starting up again. So that's super exciting. And then um, in October and November, I'm having a solo show of my collage paintings um, at the CM <laughs> these acronyms. Uh, the City Market Artist Collective. So it's just yeah. around the corner from Art Space. What is yeah. it, CMHC? Yeah, okay. So there, that I'm having that there. And then I'll have, um, so my paintings, and also I, I'm, I have this um, collaboration with a textile artist, someone who sews beautifully, and she's taken some of my designs and she's made kind of sewing paintings out of them. So I'll have a few of those pieces too. 
So oh, that's incredible. We'll make sure to include all of that information in the show notes. Um, and how can our listeners stay connected to you, your website and social okay. media handles? So yes, I have a website, which is my name, www.chiekomurasugi.com. And then my Instagram handle is um, C Murasugi, my initial C and then my last name. So yeah. So thank you. Yeah, no, this has been absolutely delightful. I know I say that about a lot of our interviews, but this has really been delightful. Thank you so much. Um, This has been amazing. We'll probably pop over, you know, if you're going to have some kind of opening over at CMAC, which is around us. And we'll, of course, invite you to come to our studios and see what we're working on, too. And I don't know, maybe we'll even be like, do you want to try the supply? You know, you talked about it earlier. Here you go. (laughs) Give it a shot. How about this paint, that thing? You know, whatever. So we'll definitely have to talk more about that. But thank you so much. No, I love our space and I hop over there quite frequently. So I'll see you. And thank you so much for this. I mean, you you know, the questions were great. I had a lot of things to think about and kind of integrate and synthesize in my mind. And it's just been a lot of fun. Um, (sighs) Yes, it has. Love it. Well, we've had a blast as well. And we know our listeners will find amazing value from these conversations. Um, For our listeners, as always, all of the links to things referenced in today's episodes, as well as links to all of our other podcast episodes will be included in the show notes for today's episode. Yep. And in between episodes, if you want to connect with Jackie or myself, we you can reach us on social media, Emma to May Art across all platforms. And I'm at J Sanders Studio on all platforms. Or if you want to stay connected to the podcast, you can follow us at Level Up Artists on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.